with you guys here this evening. Um, John, I know now what, I now know what it feels like when you get up and you're like, well, my sermon was already preached like three or four times uh, through the song and through the videos. And so if there's anything that you get from this evening, um, if, if it's not anything that I say because maybe you don't like the sound of my voice, um, remember, <laughs> remember the song that we sang that there is nothing better than God. There's nothing better than than Jesus. That, that's, that's where we're going to start this evening, and that's where we're going to end, and we're going to probably take a little bit of a while to get there. Um, but if there's anything you walk away with this evening, it's that. It's that there's nothing better than Jesus. And so there's just two announcements that I want that I want to just kind of give you guys real quick before we jump into the sermon this evening. And the first uh, is that of baptism. So uh, for it, we don't we're not going to have like a huge like event in order to, for you guys to get baptized. So if you guys haven't been baptized uh, and you want to get baptized, we're just going to say hey, now's a great time to take that step of obedience and get baptized and to publicly proclaim your faith. And so if you're interested in that or you have some questions or you wanna know some more, uh, we have uh, some baptism applications in the back. Just take one if you're, if you're curious about it. There's information in there uh, and we'd love to have a conversation with you about that as well. Uh, and also we um, are doing our global outreach trip to Mississippi, Jackson, Mississippi in June, June 19th to the 25th. And uh, so once again, if you're interested or you still don't know where Mississippi is, go grab a information packet and you might be able to find out. Once again, there's a bunch of info there that your parents are gonna wanna know about um, if, um, if you are gonna end up going on that trip. So there's gonna be an informational meeting on Sunday, which you're gonna forget. So we put it on the back of this. So just give this, give your sermon notes um, to your parents. Um, and it has the time on there. It's gonna be 1245 after the third service. Um, and just w- one of the great things about a trip like this of, of going to Jackson, Mississippi is that um, it, a lot of times when we go uh, out of like the regular rhythms of our lives and we go to a place that's outside of our comfort zone, it's usually there that God begins to work in our hearts. It's, it's the place where we are uncomfortable. It's the place where we have to place faith in God because we don't know what is around the next corner or the next conversation. And I would encourage you that if that's something that you're looking for, if that's something where you're saying, I know God is, is asking me to take a step of obedience, to take a step of faith, I wanna encourage you that this trip to Mississippi uh, is gonna be a great opportunity for that. And so we're gonna jump into our sermon this evening. So if you guys can just open up your Bibles, whether it's on your phone or or you have it in hand to 1 John chapter two, uh, we're gonna be in verses 15 through uh, 17. And what we're obviously covering is this, this sermon series that we've been doing for the past couple of weeks called Belief. And what we have been investigating in belief is this big kind of main idea that what we trust shapes how we live. And so we've been unpacking this in, in, a, in a variety of different ways. And what we're really unashamedly trying to get at is at your belief. We want to know what you believe and we want to ask you to challenge also what you believe and really kind of kick the tires a little bit on what you believe and what you trust in and see if that thing is actually legitimate. And obviously we're, we're, we're coming here to say, once again, unashamedly, that we want you to believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We want you to believe in, in, in this definition that we've given, that it's the gospel is God's plan to save sinners and restore creation through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. That this gospel is God's plan, his intent and his intention to have a relationship with you. And when we trust in that, when we place faith in that, that then shapes how we live and how we navigate through our, our lives. And, and, and we, we want you to believe in the gospel because we genuinely do believe from God's word and in the conviction in our hearts that it is the thing that will truly give you the most joy in your life because there is nothing better than Jesus. And so there's kind of two Big ideas, and I want to connect for us tonight as we go into this passage. And it's one is, is, is really our sermon series arc, which is what we trust shapes how we live. So this is the one idea, right? That the thing that we're putting faith in, the thing that we're trusting in, it necessarily shapes then how we live. And, and I also kind of want to tweak this a little bit. And this is kind of going to be the main point or the main idea of our sermon is that it's also what we love that shapes how we live, right? So when we're talking about what we trust, really what we're also talking about is what we love. 
what the thing that we cherish, the thing that we treasure, the thing that's most important to us in our lives. You're gonna see this kind of language coming out in this text that we're gonna be covering today. And I want you to see that those two words, that the idea of trust and the idea of love, they're really capturing the same idea. That the thing that captures our imagination and our heart and our mind and our affections, our time, our focus, our money, it's those things that necessarily shape then how we live. And so, I want you to open up your Bibles and let's read this passage of scripture together and see what God's word has to say. This is what God's word has to say to us this evening. It says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Unfortunately, the struggle that we face when it comes to thinking about what we love is that we, is that we often, we don't think about how what we love, what we treasure, what we spend all of our time on, how that thing actually shapes our lives. Like, like when's the last time that you thought about, you know, you binging, I don't know, 10 hours of Bridgerton is shaping your morality or your, or how your theology or how you think through life. Just, just put in anything there that maybe you spent more than 10 hours on this week, not including school, maybe. Um, and, and think about how is that thing, spending all that time on a thing, you, we don't necessarily sit down and think, you know, before we watch Netflix, like, oh yeah, this is really gonna shape these different pieces and parts of my heart and my life. But over time, what we love, what we spend our time on shapes um, our, our lives. And we don't think about that. It reminds me of a, a conversation that I had with a college student a couple of years ago working at another church. And um, he had made some, some pretty poor decisions in his life. He ended up getting kicked out of college. Um, and he was in this ROTC Air Force program. And he was trying to get back into that because his, his like, life goal was to follow in the footsteps of, of, his, of his dad and to be in the Air Force. Uh, I think that was a really honorable thing, but he, he was just like set on this thing. He's like, I've, I've got to accomplish this thing. And so we're sitting across from sushi because that's what you do in college. You eat way too much and you gain way too much weight. And then you spend the rest of your life trying to work it off. Um, and so we're sitting there eating sushi and, and he, he kind of has his epiphany as we're talking about life. And he's like, you know what? I, th- I think I figured it out. I know what I need. And he looks, and I'm like, my heart is welling up at this moment. I'm just like, oh, I'm really hoping he says like, I, I need Jesus. <laughs> and he's like, I've got it. I, I really need a girlfriend. <laughs> and I was crushed, absolutely crushed as his leader, just being like, oh, where, where have I gone wrong? Like, God, like I need to repent. Um, and he's just, and he begins to gush about how I just need someone to affirm me and, and, and love me and, and tell me that I'm, that, that, that I'm okay and that like everything's gonna be okay and that like this difficult time in my life, I'm gonna make it through it and just someone to hold me. And, and in some way, those things are, those are all, I guess, good things. But he made this, this one small thing, this idea of having a girlfriend or being in a relationship with someone, that this thing would be his functional savior. It would be the thing that would make everything else in his life, all the poor decisions that he had made, and then the, 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 the kind of ensuing now year that he had been in of, of difficulty and hardship, that it would kind of make it all okay. The statement that he said, like, all I need is a girlfriend was a statement of love and a statement of trust. He's probably way, way more honest than we are. And he just said what he thought his God was. We we won't necessarily put it in those terms, but that's what he was saying. And his honesty in a way was almost endearing to me because he, he he just laid it out there and said, this is what I want. This is what I need. It's a statement of what he loved and what he trusts. And so, this idea, this, this idea of what we trust and what we love is, is an idea that John brings up in this whole letter of, of, of 1 John. At the end of it, in the last, very, very last verse in chapter 5, verse 21, he kind of just throws in this line that everyone's like, what? Like, where did this come from? But if you're reading the book, you understand what he's saying. But he says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Keep yourselves from idols. You see, those things that we love and that we trust that we put all of our faith and our hope in, that we look to for, for worth and for pleasure and for meaning and identity, everything that's not God, those things are idols. 
And what John is saying to this church here and what he is saying to us tonight is that we need to guard ourselves from idols. We need to be careful about what we love because what we love, what we maybe metaphorically in our hearts bow down and worship, that thing is going to shape how we live, how we think, what we believe. And so I just want to clarify one thing as well. Uh, Just because everything can be an idol doesn't mean that everything in your life that you love is an idol. Does that make sense? That I'm not saying like, okay, like, I, I, you know, I like playing sports. Okay. There's an idol. You can't do that anymore. That's not, that's not what I'm saying, but everything in your life has the potential to be an idol because we, we make it that with our hearts. And so has everyone got their sermon notes here? So at the bottom of your sermon notes, there's a bunch of questions here that underneath where it says, reflect on these things. And these are a couple of questions that you can ask that I'm just gonna read them out loud here, but you can ask these things of your own heart to kind of begin to kind of figure out what, maybe what are some of the idols in my life? And and the questions go like this, like like what has your attention? What, What is the thing that you're thinking about all the time that you just can't get out of your mind? What's the thing that you're, you're longing for, you're, you're, you're searching for, you're searching the internet for? What kind of things frustrate you or make you angry when you don't get it? And no, frustrated is not a word, uh, but frustrated is. Um, what, what, what are you looking to that defines you? Or what is it or who is it that defines you? What or who makes you happy? And maybe even what are you running to for relief? All of these questions are kind of just, are are, are things that you can ask yourself that are gonna get you a little bit closer to helping you identify maybe what are those things that you love and that you trust that the Bible would call idols in your heart and your life that you need to be aware of that might maybe even unknowingly be shaping who you are and how you live. And so as, as we kind of enter into this, this, this text here, I think what, what we're, we're really trying to answer, like I said about earlier is, is what is better? Like, which, which is better? Is, is it love of the world or is it God? And we're gonna unashamedly say it's, it's God. Worship of God is, is the thing that actually shapes us and gives us joy and meaning and purpose and identity in our lives. But I don't want you to just take my word for it. I, want, I don't want you to just trust me blindly because I'm up here. I want you to see in God's word as well that, that, that it is God who is the one who is better than all these other things that the world is offering us. And so once again, just to restate the main point here, uh, what we love shapes how we live. And so we're gonna kind of unpack this in three ways. One is that worship is all around us. Two, we're gonna look at how the problem is worship within us. And then lastly, we're gonna look at how Jesus uses worship to shape us. And so we're gonna kind of walk through this text as we do that. So once again, verse 15, it says, do not love the world or the things in this world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the father is not in him. And so the command here is pretty clear in the text. Don't love the world. Don't love the world. But I'm sure as you guys know, when anyone tells you not to do something, it kind of, you're like, well, now I have to go do it. Um, And so let let me just try and convince you for a moment why loving the world, uh, at least initially, is is not a great idea. You see, we we live in the middle of a world that I'm going to call a theater of worship. It's a theater of love. All of the the branding and the marketing and the media that we live that that we live kind of like in the midst of whether you it's on your phones, on Instagram if you're an influencer or it's on YouTube and you have a channel, everyone is trying to sell worship of something. Now yes, it's not necessarily oh like I'm bowing down to a golden calf. Like I don't think many of us are tempted to do that, but it's a different kind of 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 worship and of love and of trust that we are giving our money and our time and our thoughts and our affections to these things that are all around us. And our world makes money off of it. They make money off of worship. I mean, we have sports stadiums that are filled with thousands of people, whether it's different fans or, or whatever it is. There's all of these things, and we live in this world, this grand theater of worship where everything and any anything is competing for your worship. Everything's competing for your love. People are paying money to buy your love and to buy your worship. We have to realize that that we live in the theater of worship. And so, and and, and if we live in this world that's filled with worship, then then we need to make sense of the fact that why is this command, don't love the world so important? So in in a sense, like why must we not love the world? And it leads us to really ask the question then, like what kind of world do we live in? 
we live in a world that's created by God. So if you go back and you read Genesis 1 and 2, you see that God created everything. He created the world. And his grand statement about everything that he had created was, it's good. It was good. But then Genesis 3 rolls around and Adam and Eve are in the garden and and sin enters into their hearts. And now we live in a world that's completely perverted and marred by sin. We live in a world, this is kind of the first sin that happened in the garden where Adam and Eve took a thing, the fruit on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they made it the thing. They went to this fruit to find knowledge and purpose and meaning. They wanted to be God. They took the thing and they ate of it. They consumed it. They worshiped it. They loved it. And in a way, then it became their God. And and what God had promised them is that if you do that, it's going to lead to spiritual death. So we live in a world that was created by God. It was initially created good, but because sin came in and ruined everything, we now live in a world where Small little things that God created become the main thing in our lives. But also in this whole creation story, we are also in this world. We live in this world. We are one of those things that are in this world. We are created things. We were created by God. Once again, like Genesis 1 and 2 says. One and, two says. and the, the, the difference though about us is that God created us in his image to reflect his glory. He literally created us to, to fill the world with his worship and with his praise and with his, his kingdom and with his rule so that everyone in the world would know that, that God is king and that he is a good and righteous king. King. That's why we were created. But sin enters into our hearts. And our then hearts are marred and are, are, we are broken because of the sin that comes in. And so we are people created by God to worship God, but sin has come in and ruined that for us. We then participate in this, this grand you know, theatrical play of, of worshiping things in the world instead of worshiping God. God. Once again, John, at the end of this letter, he calls those things idols. And he says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. So obviously it's pretty clear at this point that worship is all around this. And this leads us to the second point, which is this, is that the problem is worship within us. Hope you're okay over there. Um, <laughs> So the problem is worship within us. You see, like we, like we said, we look back to who we are and who we were created to be. We we're people created in the image of God and we were created to worship. Our hearts were designed to be filled with awe and with wonder and with worship of something. That's why God created us. Is it happening to everyone now? This is great. Um, okay, and so because you're in my hearts, Let's bring it back here, guys. Because your and my hearts were designed to worship and to love and to trust things, we often give our worship and our love and our trust to other things in our lives. And so I'm gonna paint like a really, really very, very broad picture here about what are some of the typical struggles and idols that are in the hearts of the guys and the girls in this room, okay? So let me just make another disclaimer as I say this. I might miss you in, what, in, the, in, in one of the two things that I'm saying here. And so just, just work with me. Uh, this is the, I'm not saying that this is like the law. I'm saying this is, this is as I've observed high school students and and different things that have been going on in their lives. These are the two kind of areas that end up uh, being things that, 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 that high school students typically run to and they end up unknowingly sometimes worship and love and trust. And so John here breaks it down as the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes and the pride of life. I think they kind of work in an order. And so I think for guys here, when it comes to the desire of the flesh, when it comes to this thing that we're saying like, if I can just get this thing, if I can just love and trust this thing, then everything's gonna be okay. For guys, it it usually looks like the idol of pleasure. And now some of you guys are getting like clammy hands because you're like, oh great, he's gonna talk about purity and I don't want (laughs) that's not That's not where I'm going, but, but hold on here for a second. So for guys, it's pleasure. Why? It's because guys, on a general level, we, we just want to feel good. We, we, it's, it's why we like sitting back and playing video games for hours on end, because it just feels good. 
Like we, 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 as, as, as guys, we, we want to just something to, essentially just to enjoy, to not have worry. It comes out in us maybe wanting to be too, too lazy, or maybe we, we work so hard to gain other people's love and approval because we, we want that because it feels good. That's just, this is why for men in general, lust is such a, a, per, a pervasive sin in their lives. It's because when things are going bad, or when life's not going the way that I want it to, or when I'm bored, or I'm by myself, or, or whatever it is, I want something to make me feel good. Or maybe I feel bad about myself, and so I want something to make me feel good. And so generally, in a general sense, the main idol that, 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 that men usually find themselves worshiping, maybe unknowingly, is the idol of pleasure. They just want something to make them feel good. And for girls, it's a, it's a little bit different. For girls, it, it comes down to to worth. Why, why worth? Why, why something like worth? Because I, I would imagine that some of the, and I've asked other girls, so, I'm, so I'm, I know I'm not totally off the rails here, but you want to feel loved. You want to feel beautiful and, and, and worthy and, and, and seen and accepted and, and, and cherished and adored. And the way that the Zuji works itself out is kind of just like this low hum of anxiety that, that rests in all of the, the hearts of the ladies here, that whenever, whatever room you walk into, whatever sphere you walk into, whether it's Instagram or, or, or your friend group or a classroom, that you're always kind of, there's this game going on of comparing, am I the prettiest one in the room? Am I dressed well enough for the occasion? If I walk up and say this thing, am I gonna be accepted? Am I gonna be like, are they gonna make fun of me when I walk away? And there's this low hum of anxiety that kind of rests in your hearts as, as we're navigating through life. These are, I think, the two, one of two of the two big things that guys and girls struggle with. And, and so it might be a crossover of both that maybe there's girls in this room that you also struggle with the idol of pleasure as there are with guys who you're yearning for someone just to notice you, that you want someone to say that you matter or that you've been seen. And we realize that these two, thi- these two things, they, they really get down to like the, the inner workings of our heart. It's not just like a, like a slap on the hand kind of thing where it's like, just stop sinning. It's, it's, it's like deep rooted in who you are as a person. And, and, and in a way, it's that way because God designed you to have pleasure, but to have it in him. He designed you to have worth, but not for you to find it in other people or in the things of this world, but to find it in Jesus. And so this, this, these desires of the flesh, they lead us then to the desires of the eyes that went away. If we, if we can't get it, then we long for it. And so for guys, we say, man, if I can just have this pleasure, it's gonna make me happy. And then there's this moment of temporal joy, like just a moment. And then it's followed by guilt and shame and self-condemnation that downward spirals into just saying, well, now because I feel like crap, I've got to go back and make myself feel good again. And it's this constant cycle that goes on and on and on again. And for for girls, it might be a similar thing where it's saying, man, like if I can just get this person or, or someone to like my post or someone to notice me or to say that I'm beautiful or that they care for me, if I can just get someone to love me and to give me worth, then it's going to be okay. But when you can't get that, then it leads to, once again, maybe just a moment of enjoyment and of pleasure, but then it leads to more worthlessness. And, and, it, never, and it always feels like, man, I can never be enough because there's always someone else in the room who's prettier than me, who's got it more together than me, that, that is smarter than me than me, then that, that's someone who's just one step ahead of me and I can never, ever keep up. It's exhausting. And the silly thing about idols, the, and it's not even silly, it's sad, is that idols always overpromise and underdeliver. Every single time. They promise pleasure, they give you shame. They promise worth and they give you worthlessness. And this then leads to like the creme de la creme, the, the pride of life. Once again, we, we go back to this truth. We were designed and created to worship and to adore God. Our hearts were created to, to give worship and praise to God. And then we turn it inward and we give praise and worship to ourselves. As Tim Keller puts it, it's, it's inflation or it's deflation. Meaning for probably for like, five or 10% of us in the room, it's like 
Everyone loves me. I'm, I'm popular. I've got it together. I'm the star athlete, maybe. I, I'm puffed up. I am so worthy of everyone's love and worship. And I am like the next best thing since sliced bread. That's a really old phrase. I probably shouldn't have used that. But it, it's this idea that like, yes, I'm awesome. And everyone else knows it. And that's pride because you're not that awesome. God's really awesome. And you need to get off that pedestal. But probably for like 90% of us, it lands in the pride, actually lands in the place of deflation. Meaning because we're so downtrodden and beaten up by our aimless pursuit of pleasure and of worth that we think everyone hates me. I'm not good enough. I, I, I'm never, ever going to be happy. I hate myself. And so I'm going to punish myself because I'm not worthy of anything or anyone's love. And that's pride as well. It's pride because it's not squaring with what the Bible says about who we are. Both inflation and deflation don't rightly see who we are when it comes to the Bible and, and who God reveals for, who, for us to be and how he created us to be. Once again, these, these idols that we go to, they always overpromise, and every single time they underdeliver. They 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 promise initially that it's going to be great, and then eventually they just enslave us unto death, spiritual death. They seem innocent and enjoyable and laissez-faire. It's 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 nothing. In a couple of months, years down the road, we've given up so much to pursue this thing that never actually gives us what we want. And so I hope here you can see that the case is pretty clear that the problem is worship within us. It's, it's because we were created to worship and because of sin in our hearts, our searching and our long, we're, we're, we're looking for something to worship, something to fill our hearts with awe and with wonder and with praise and with, 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 with pleasure, but we're going to the world. And so in this question of which is better, I, re I really hope that you can come to the conclusion on your own from, from listening here tonight that this love of the world, when it says here in verse 16 that it's not from the Father, that those desires are from the world, that you'll believe that to be true. Because it's only when you believe the truth about what those things are, about what the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes and the pride of life really are, that change can actually happen in our lives through what Jesus has done for us. And so this leads us to our last point that Jesus then uses worship to shape us. Jesus uses worship to, to shape us. Like we talked about, what we trust shapes how we live. What we love shapes how we live. What we worship shapes how we live. It's, it's the thing that we focus on, that we behold, that we treasure, that we think about, that we're searching for, that thing that we just can't wait to get to, to spend time with. It's that thing that shapes us. And I'm a super nerd, and so I, I tried to not use uh, examples from Lord of the Rings, but I couldn't not use an example from the Lord of the Rings of this in this situation. But if you guys have watched those, watched those movies or if you've read the book, if you read the book, you're, you're actually like a, a good friend of mine. We should talk afterwards. Um, in, in the movies, there's this character named Gollum. And what Gollum does is that Gollum finds, and I'm trying to get my ring off here, but now because I'm really nervous, it's not coming off. There you go. He finds this ring. He finds this ring of power, and he murders his friend to get it. Because he, he, he hears what the ring is saying. It's, it's like this evil ring. And this ring is promising him that if he gets it, it'll give him power. It'll give him the ability to live an eternal life. And so he kills his friend to get it. And he takes, he, he's a normal guy when this all starts. He's what's called like a hobbit or a river folk. I'm just going to get into the nerdum here. And, and he's this totally normal guy. But then what he does is he takes this ring and he, he loves it. And he fawns over it. And there's like these moments, these cut scenes in the show where he's saying like, he's like petting it like, like a cat. And he's saying like, my precious, like my precious. And he's like fawning and treasuring and loving and thinking about and, and, and fantasizing about this ring. And eventually it takes him off into these, these mountains and he just dives literally into these dark caves in this mountain so he can just be alone with the thing that he loves so that no one else in all of his life can take away this thing that he loves and he treasures so, so much. And he turns into this vile, slick, gross creature, a, a, a emaciated fraction of a human being. 
that, that he's, he's this evil, twisted being because he's just been fawning over this ring, this thing that promised him life. And sure, it promised him like a long, long life because he's like 500, 600 years old, but he is angry and he's bitter and he hates the ring, but he loves the ring because his life is built around the ring, but he hates it because it's destroying him. This is just a story of what happens to us in our hearts when we love the world. Over a lifetime of us treasuring and beholding and loving and thinking about and worshiping and bowing down at the altar of the things of this world, we turn into Gollum. We, we, we turn into this person who we, we hate our lives but we don't know any better. And so we can't even change ourselves. But once again, this, this, this points back to this, this, this way, this, this hard wiring, that, this way that God has made us. He's created us to worship. He's created us to love and to care for something. But the Bible shares a different story. The gospel shares a different story. It shares a story of a man like in Matthew 13, 44, who he found a treasure in a field and he went and sold everything that he had to get it. And he did it in joy. Jesus uses this example as a, as this is not coming off the table. He uses this as an example of the kingdom of heaven. We see that God sends his son, Jesus, to us to come and to bring new life. It, when, when we focus in on, when we treasure and we place faith in and love and trust in Jesus and we behold who Jesus is and we hold the love of God close to our heart, it doesn't, once again, overpromise and underdeliver. It changes us, it transforms us. It, it opens our eyes to see what life really is. Like we just saying, like this is what living really looks like. It's not this, this endless cycle of just, oh, I, I'm disappointed and I have to get back another, get on another high of pleasure or of worth and be disappointed again. That's not what a relationship with God looks like. And that's not why God sent his son to, he sent his son to us so that we could find a new worship, a new thing, a, a new person, God to worship and to adore in our hearts. You see, worship of Jesus is better because when we focus in on who Jesus is and what he has done for us and how through the power of his Holy Spirit, he's actually able to change the very fabric of our being to create, to turn us from being people who are lost in sin to being people who are found in Christ. Then our hearts can actually and truly change. We can see that worship of Jesus is better. We see that pleasure and worth, they don't have to be a God but we also do see that they actually do both come from God. But true pleasure, true pleasure and fulfillment and awe is being in a relationship with God. And you might say, fat joke. But, but what could be more pleasurable than being fully known in, in the, to the fullest extent of the word that God knows everything about you, every moment and molecule of your life, every single imperfection. And he decidedly says, I still love you. And I sent my son to die for you. That is true love. That is true pleasure all of our searching for something that's going to fulfill us. It ends in Jesus because, G because in a relationship with Jesus, we can have full and, and, and complete pleasure in him. And also then it addresses our, our, our idol of worth that we realize that our, our worth, it doesn't come from what other people say or what other people ad address us as, but worth actually has very little to do about us. And it has everything to do with Jesus who spilt his precious, innocent blood that paid in full the debt of our sin. That Jesus willingly, lovingly went to the cross and paid that price to buy you. 
And so our worth is not caught up in what someone else can say about you because it's all caught up in what Jesus has already done. It's caught up in his life and his death and his resurrection. And so that even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so then this leads to us having a a biblical view of, of otherwise what is called humility, but a biblical view of what it means to be inflated and deflated. We, we can be filled with pride about who we are when we place faith in Jesus because God loves us. We are a part of his family. We are children of God if we place faith in Jesus. But then we can also be biblically deflated where we can know, man, I'm a wretch in my sin. But once again, Jesus has come and he has saved me from my sin. And now he has given me new life. And that is what biblical humility and pride looks like. That we would rejoice in God's redemption of us. And we would also then be humbled by the fact that we were totally undeserving, but he came to us anyways. Friends, we we become what we love. We become what we worship. We become what we trust. And as verse 17 says, the world is passing away along with its desires. In other words, if you worship the world, you will pass away just like the world will. You will be eternally separated from God because of what you worshiped. But whoever does the will of God abides forever is what the last verse says. When we worship God, we find, like Marin said in the video before the sermon, we find eternal hope. We find a God who loves us despite and in spite of our sin. And who's saying to every single one of you here in this room tonight that he wants to have a relationship with you. And so I just want to I just want to ask you what, what are you trusting in tonight? What, what are those things that you're you're running to for hope, for meaning, for for purpose? What are those things that you're running to for for pleasure or for worth? And I want to encourage you tonight in just in a moment we're going to pray. I want to encourage you to to just simply say to God, God, I I don't want to worship that thing anymore. I want to worship you. I want to have a relationship with you. And if you pray that, that, that prayer, I, I just want to encourage you to, to chat with your life group leader about it or come and see me up here at the front or anyone that you've seen on stage tonight, Hannah or myself or John or Josh. And we would love to talk with you about how Jesus opened up our eyes to help us to see that the worship of the world was the end of our lives, but that the worship of Jesus gave us real life. And so let's just take a moment right now and pray. Pray for these things to sink into our hearts. Father, we give you thanks. We give you praise because you are worthy of worship, Father. And the worship of you gives us real pleasure and it gives us real worth. So Father, I, I, I too repent of worshiping the things of this world, of often getting caught up on things that are, are small things that do not deserve any praise and any worship. I repent of that, Father, and I turn to you and say, God, I want to worship you. Help my unbelief. Help my lack of faith. Father, and at your right hand, give me pleasure forevermore, like Psalm 16, verse 11 says. Remind me that I'm a child of God through placing faith in what your son Jesus has done for me on the cross. So Father, we give you praise because there is no one better than you. We pray this in Christ's name, amen.